Yo, I am in Bisbee, Arizona. And I'm about to go on a tour. Let's go. Queen Mine Tours. Used to be an old mine that was shut down. And in the uh, 70s, I believe, they opened it up for the uh, tour. Don't sleep on Bisbee. It's a gorgeous little town with tons of stuff to do. Check this out. They used to do things. Oh, it's cast iron. This was for very interesting. And this is what we'll be riding on on our little tour. Just straddle this baby. Before I pull out of there, I will ask if you want to leave. You may not know you don't want to be underground until you are underground. So if you get to that point, you decide, hey, this is really not for me. I don't want to do this. We understand. We don't take it personal. So I'm going to bring you back outside, take it again, and you will get a full refund. So we realize not everybody belongs, not everybody wants to be underground. After that, I will stop opening an air door. The purpose of air door is to control the flow of the air in the mine. We need to make sure the air goes where we want it to go. Go about uh, 75 feet past that. We make another stop. That is the first time you will get off the train. We go up 36 steps into the area known as the Stoke. Spend a few minutes up there talking about the origination of the mining and the concept of the use of that scope. We back on the train. We go a total of 1,500 feet into the mountain. We will again get off the train and we'll do a walking tour. We're talking about the mining techniques, closer to this part of the cemetery, and about the place you see it and go back to the village. This is your tour. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Uh, pictures, take over the pictures if you want. You're more than welcome to. Uh, with the top flash, it doesn't bother. Before we head underground, does anybody have any questions? Everybody needs to put on a helmet. With a light. Over here, all right, everybody. After everybody gets their uh, hat, their helmet, and light, here we go.
Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Now let's get this over with, huh? Hey, welcome to Bisbee and welcome to the Queen Mine. If you notice right above the steel door we came in, it says Queen 1950, and that tells you two things. One, the mine you're entering today is the Queen. 1915 is the year that this level of the Queen was cut. Now this is a haulage level. There are seven levels here, two below you, you're on three, there are four above you. Now the purpose of the Queen is, they start mining here in 1878, the ore is discovered in 1877, by the time you go from 1878 to 1915, they're so deep into this mountain. Uh, lengthwise, vertically and horizontally, they need a better way to get men and equipment in and the ore back out, thus this haulage level. Now the Queen has 150 miles worth of tunnels and tracks inside. Wow. Perspective on that, you lay that in the end, that will take you from here to Casa Grande. Oh wow. 29 major mines in Bisbee. There's over 2,200 miles okay? of yeah. mine and track underneath Bisbee. That will take you all the way across the United States from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic, and you'll have two to 300 miles left over if those were placed in the end. Now, we are a copper mine, but we also mined out six metals. We're copper, gold, silver, lead, zinc, and magnet. That makes us a what is known as a bonus mine for two reasons fact we have six metals and the other fact is the quality of the ore that comes out. We run 80 to 90 percent copper in our malachite and azurite and turquoise which is highly unusual. Usually you're going to run around 20 to 30 percent. If you look straight ahead you're going to see a red light. Now just before we get to that light if you look off to your left you'll see an incline tunnel. That is the copper twin shaft. That shaft drops 400 feet below us off to the left. 45 degree angle, 45 degree angle off to the right, another 400 feet to the surface. Now there are two cells in this one. If you look to the left, you will see a set of wooden stairs goes down. That is the manway. The miner coming to work, the Lord is in our shift, he's going to go down 800 feet of stairwell before his day begins. When he gets to the bottom, steps off on his level, that's when the 10 hours begin. On the right side, you will see a small ore cart that's called a skiff. Cable hooks to the front, it's drawn to the surface by a, a small motor, uh, it drops below us, ore is put in it, it's drawn to the surface dump and lowered back down. That turned out to be a very slow, expensive, and ineffective way of moving the ore, so they went to the bottom and they cut the first vertical shaft in Bisbee that had a cage. That is called the Czar. The Czar actually broke ground the head frame for that, or the A frame for it, set in the parking lot where your cars currently are. That gives you kind of an orientation where you're at inside this mountain compared to where you were when you arrived. Any questions before we head deeper? Now, my question for y'all, does anyone need to leave? Has anyone decided this is really not for me?
train will go up 36 stairs into the stove. If you cannot do 36 stairs, if you want to stay down here, my partner will stay with you. Otherwise, let's head upstairs. Really feel the air right here. That is cool. Folks, welcome to the stove. Now, the stove is defined as an area that has been or is being mined out. Now, the stove you're standing in is the smallest stove in Bisbee. It's also the first one cut. There are thousands of them throughout Bisbee. And the reason you have a stove is when you're mining for copper, it forms in large masses, just like coal. So when you take the copper out, this is what's left behind. Now, this stove drops 30 feet below us. And like I say, this is the smallest, it is the first record behind me, about 75 feet. You'll find one about 15 times the size of this. Uh, for roughly 400 meters from here, you'll find one of our largest, not the very largest, but one of them. It's been called the ballpark. The reason is, it's large enough to build any professional ball game in it and have room for all the parking as well. So it's, that is a huge mass of copper. Now, when you're following in and you're cutting in on your copper, all the roads you see that 2,200 miles of tunnel and popping, those are roads to us. Uh, we're not taking out ore when we're mining there. We're simply going from one body of ore to another. If you look off the sides, uh, off the top, over the top of what we call a, a square set, a wooden structure, you will see a tunnel goes back 400 feet to the surface. That is the first tunnel cut in this but is it up for fresh air? We use it for that now, but, but that's not the original purpose. The original purpose is to follow a vein of silver. Because the minerals they find on the outside of this mountain in 1877, they find two minerals, actually three. But they find silver, lead, which runs in a vein. They also find evidence of copper. Well, they have no idea where the copper is because it does not run in a vein. Right. So they get lucky. When they're cutting this tunnel, they're actually following a vein of silver and some lead. And they get in here and got lucky and hit this body of copper. At that point, they called the engineers. The uh, corporate headquarters for Phelps Dodge was in New York City. They sent mining engineers down. And that's when they decided, hey, you're not going to have a silver mine. You will have a copper mine. And so began the process of recruitment. They recruited miners from all over the world because there were not enough miners in, er, in the United States to mine this, because it was going to take thousands of miners. So they went throughout Europe, South America, South Africa, uh, went into the Yugoslavian countries, uh, but they didn't recruit strictly miners. But when you get into the Yugoslavian countries, for instance, they recruited building designers, draftsmen, skilled labor to come in and build all the structure they needed for the hospitals, the libraries, the schools, the New York Stock Exchange they had, they had casinos, theaters, everything you needed to sustain a life was right here. Second largest city west of Mississippi. Only one that beat them out was San Francisco at that time. So that's what how Bisbee came to be. Now, along with the, the building of this, when you look in this room, if you look right here, you'll see a pneumatic drill. And the pneumatic drills come out in the 1890s, but they're, they're deemed to be unsafe because they'll fill up a room like this full of silica dust in about 15 minutes. Miners are dying of silicosis. 
So these did not come in vogue until they not only had water or air going to them, they also had water going to them to settle the dust. <clears throat> and in the 1900s, about 1907, 1908, they become mandated to the unions by the companies that owned all the mines. Not only Phelps Dodge, all the major mines went in and told the unions, we don't care what you think, we don't care what you say, you're going pneumatic. If a miner doesn't want to go pneumatic, there's the door, they're fired. And oh, by the way, the government's hiring is called the draft. We can already predict, <laughs> we need a lot of copper coming on because you have electricity coming in, uh, telephones coming in, automobiles are, are getting involved, but also we can already predict we're going into war in Europe. So a lot of guys decided, hey, we'll, we'll quit. Well, when they quit, they get drafted. They get to the induction center, and the induction center is reading their paperwork. Oh, you were a miner of copper in Bisbee. Guess what? You're going back to Bisbee. You're going to mine copper, but you're going to do it as a soldier yeah. at a soldier's salary, okay. which means you do not get bonus and you're not making maybe 10 cents on the dollar that the miner is making. So they were right back here mining in uniform as soldiers, continued to mine throughout the war, and a lot of them stayed on and actually made it a career of mining in Bisbee. They were back where they started a whole lot less money. But this particular room, that inclined shaft, and this 400 uh, foot tunnel you see up here, were all cut by hand. The days of and this is this is the way they would cut it. You come to work, you're gonna work ten hours a day, six days a week, three dollars a day. Ten pound starter steel or a starter steel, ten pound single jack. You have to drive this starter steel into your mountain six to eight inches. It is called collaring the hole. The reason you collar the hole so that you can put a longer steel in it. So you're going to strike that as hard as you can, turn it a quarter of a turn, strike it, turn it, strike it, turn it. You turn it to keep it from getting stuck, plus it makes a circular hole easier to put explosives in. So once you're, you've collared the hole, you remove that, you set it aside, and you get serious about what you're doing. You go with a series of longer steels to get up to about eight feet. This is about a 20 inch steel. Now you're gonna slide that into that collared hole and you're going to get serious about what you're doing. And instead of a 10 pound single jack, you'll have a 28 pound double jack. And it's a two man job. One man holds the steel, he is called the shaker. Every time it's struck, he has to turn it. So strike, turn, strike, turn, strike, turn, strike, turn. The striker, you're part of the team standing back here. Yeah. He's going to come around. He's going to hit this as hard as he can. It gets turned. He's right back in. He hits it again. Now your striker, a good striker is going to hit it about 30 times a minute. Your shaker never lets go of the steel. If the shaker lets go of the steel, steel simply bounces out of the mountain. Because instead of the energy transferring into your mountain to crack your mountain, it simply stays in the steel, forcing the steel back out of the mountain. You can do that 10 hours a day and you do it by candlelight. Before the days of electricity, before the days of the carbide lamps. So two miners come to work in here, they will be issued for a day, they're gonna get six 10 inch candles. You can only burn one at a time to make it through your 10 hour shift. So you come in, you stab or set up your first candle, get it lit and you begin driving still. When that one's burned down, almost burned out, you're gonna light your second one by your first one, your third one by your second one and so forth throughout the day. Six candles will get you through 10 hour shift to drill as many holes three feet deep as you have time to, and that'll be dictated by the hardness of the rock you're in. Three feet deep as you have time to blast, haul it out of here in either wheelbarrows with steel rimmed wheels or in gunny sacks. Start the same process all over again the next day. Now, if you notice in here, there are all, a lot of tunnels come into here. You look back over here, this one goes back about 360 feet to the surface. Uh, railroad track extends down the end of it, floor car, same with the original. But if you can see them all, there's about 12 to 13 tunnels come in. And the reason is, when you finish a body of floor, you simply tunnel out of that body of floor to the next body of floor. 
when you're actually cutting a body of form, you want to come into it at more than one level. That allows you a easier way to actually go in and plant so the ore drops below you and takes it out of here. If you look at this guy, he is called a raised miner. He's the best paid miner in the industry. <laughs> All he, he drills straight overhead 100 feet. He's going 200 feet another body of ore. And as he drills to that wooden structure, Slot behind him, he's going to set up those wooden structures and say, Look, those are. And he gets paid by the foot. And you pay over, you get base paid, the miner gets two checks. He gets a base pay and he gets a bonus check. Anything over six feet in one day, he gets $100 per foot when the mine is closed in the 1970s. Guy landed a railroad track, anything beyond seven feet, he gets $100 a foot. Your tonnage miner, your bonus miner, the stoper, which is working in here, he gets paid, his base pay says you'll haul X number of tons out of here in your shift. Anything above that, you'll get a bonus based on tonnage. And that's the way a good miner can make double his salary, maybe triple his salary through his bonus program. So that's where the real money was in the mining. It wasn't necessarily the base pay, but it was yeah. the bonus pay. Any questions about anything in here? Did the military guys uh, get a bonus? No, sir. <laughs> they got their flat pay. That is yeah. all they got. And kind of give you a, a look at what soldiers made in that time frame. When I went into the military, uh, my pay for a entire month was $80. So in 1877, an underground miner in Bisbee was making almost what I was making a hundred years later when I joined the military. And that was without his bonus. Wow. Any other questions? How many of you people would be in this room at once? In here, due to the grade of explosives, which is a much lower grade, uh, you might have two teams working in here back in the 1800s, early 1900s. Today, you would never have two teams. You'd be one team because the explosives are much more powerful and you're using a, a If I drill today and blast today, I'm going one blast, I'm gonna take 140 to 180 sticks of dynamite for one blast. In here, you might have been taking uh, 10 at the most, and sometimes it wasn't dynamite. There was black powder and it was a much lower grade of explosive than what we have.
God. If somebody wants to stand right between these two pieces of equipment, you're more than welcome to do so. Go ahead and, and fill in if you would, please, so we can everybody can get down far enough that they can see. Hey, folks, I told you at our first stop that there are 29 major mines in Bisbee and that you were on the Queen. Where I parked the train is actually the junction of three of the 29 mines. When you got off the train, you headed this way, you're no longer in the Queen. You are now in the Southwest. So you, the, the Queen is seven levels, the Southwest is eight, still 100 feet between each level. You're still level three, but instead of four above you, you now have five. On the far side, of the train, you may have noticed a third one, that is the Copper Prince. Now the Copper Prince is also known and has always been known as an evacuation route. All mines had to have evacuation routes. Thank you. All mines have to have evacuation routes. The Queen was an evacuation route. The Copper Prince is an evacuation route for the Queen. The Queen served for the Copper Prince. They also serve for the Higgins, the Southwest, the Uncle Sam, a lot of different mines that go back through here. The Sunrise, all 29 mines interlocked. They all had to have uh, evacuation routes because not every mine goes to the surface, and that includes the one you're in. Uh, right behind me, you're going to see four doors. Those are called transfer chute doors. Directly behind them, there is a transfer chute that goes overhead around 300 feet. It's 20 feet across behind me, 15 feet deep. We'll hold around 300 tons of ore. The levels above us, as they're mining, they will dump the ore using carts like this into that transfer chute. It will drop down here, and then a guy down here known as a trammer is going to open one of these doors, fill one of these one-ton carts about three-quarters of the way full. So he's got about 27, 2,800 pounds, and he's going to push it to the surface. One man, one cart. You fill it, you push it out, you dump it, you push it back in, you fill it, you push it back out. You do that 10 hours a day, six days a week. Beginning miner's possession, starting around uh, 14, 15 years of age up into the early to mid 20s. Now, in 1907, Phelps Dodge has all, all these years been using mules on the surface. The mules are used to move equipment around, uh, to haul things up and down the mountains to get the equipment in here. So they decided, let's try using mules Please don't shine your lights in other people's eyes. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, so they decided, let's try mules underground. So they trained the mules on the surface to haul four of these carts out. And this is what the mule will hear. That's the sound of the carts hooking together. As soon as the mule hears that fourth hookup, it will begin to pull. So the way that it operates, you bring the mule down, hook it up to the first cart, and then you start hooking the others up. Get the fourth one hooked, the mule pulls, takes it to the surface, dumps it, brings it back in, and that is the way it operates. Well, by now, miners are bonus miners, and so a bunch of them get together and decide, we're going to hook up cart number five, the mule hauls four, the mule will never know we've hooked up number five, and once we hook up that fifth one, our bonus money goes up. Well, they hook that cart up, number four begins to pull, pulls back on the reins, and hook up number five. When they did, they said the mule was just standing there and glaring at them like, no, I do not, I'm not doing this. I do four and no more. Slow them down more. Uh, if they tried to force the mule to pull, they said the mule would actually just sit down wow. and just ignore them like nobody was standing around. Here's that fifth disconnect. So the mule would stand up, stare at the miner, start braying as so it's laughing at them, haul the four out, haul that fifth. Uh, we kind of looked at them as the first organized labor in the industry. <laughs> in, in the 1920s, that train brought you in. Those cars are called man cars, what you rode on. Those are from the 1920s. The two motors attached to that train, uh, one of them is out of the 1920s, one is out of the 1930s. And you look at this one right up here, this is a Goodman. Those two up there are Manches. The Goodman is out of the 1940s. Started its career in Bisbee. Wound up in Canada, came back to Bisbee three years ago. So it's got a long history. Well, those could haul 10 to 12 one ton carts out of here at about 10 miles an hour. But if you look right up here, you see this, this uh, bare copper wire. Well, that bare copper wire carries 240 volts of direct current. 
when you leave today, go out the front <coughs> to the left, you'll see a massive metal up against a chain link fence. That is a trolley. An arm comes out of the top of it, just like the trolleys in San Francisco. It hits this, now it's going to pull. The current is complete, the circuit is complete, and it will pull out of here at about 40 miles an hour while pulling 80 tons. So 81 ton cars out of here at 40 miles an hour. With that in advent, they went from a one ton carts to two tons to three tons, five and six ton carts. Because 100 carts going through here at one time made kind of a, a welding situation. So they went to the lower carts. Phelps, or the larger carts. Phelps Dodge continued using uh, the trolleys and the trains until they closed here in 1975. Any questions on that process? How long do these miners live? I'm sorry? 30. Well, I don't know. What age did those miners live? Oh, uh, miners started, you get back into the 1800s, before the labor laws, the uh, kids take care, the individuals taking care of the mules were about 8 to 12 years old. Uh, the miners themselves would start around 15 years of age. Uh, my dad worked for Phelps Dodge for 37 years. And that's true of a lot of guys that I graduated high school with. They worked for Phelps Dodge from right out of high school uh, till they retired in their 60s. Yeah. So it, uh, there was no gyms in Bisbee. You're either slamming hammer or you're pushing one of these carts up and down through there. So it was, uh, it was a different life, but it was a good life. Any other questions? What were they eating with the down here in the mine and yeah. whatnot. Yeah, uh, you go back to the 1800s when the mines first started. There were three small restaurants that just outside the, they call it Queen, or outside the shaft here. A miner come into work, could stop there if so desired, and order lunch. Say, okay, I'm working at Stoke so and so. Have them bring me lunch. And just about lunchtime, an eight, nine, ten year old boy come trotting down through the tunnels with your lunch. You tip him a penny or two, you're good for the day. Uh, one of the, when you get into the European miners, one of their uh, meals of choice was called a pasty. Uh, if you're from around here, you know what empanadas are. Mm -hmm. Well, a pasty is a rather large empanada, and you fill it with, uh, and the crust is a little different, but you put meat in it potatoes in it, onions in it, whatever you want in it. Fills it over, it's baked. One reason they like that, you hold it like a piece of watermelon. You hold it at the ends and you eat it. And that way when you got to the ends, you did not eat the ends because you've been holding those with your hands. Those are contaminated. You throw them away and the mice and the rats and the cockroaches feast off them. And you didn't want to eat them because they have all sorts of minerals, anything from arsenic to lead, whatever you find underground here. 276 minerals underground, any one of them could be embedded in that. That bite you. Thank you. Now, if, if your daddy wants to help you up on it, we've got to do it. That sound good? What is that? You want to guess what it is? Why? You got that exactly right. This is the <laughs> boss's bicycle. This is the way the boss would get around to see all the miners. He had seen every miner twice a day. So he's walking about 10 to 15 miles a day. So he's just riding a bicycle. That was a good guess. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, any other questions? If you want to help him get up on this, these fish, whatever, you're more than welcome to do so. All right, folks, let's go ahead and step down. And You'll see three drills right up here. If we stop at those drills, we're going to talk about them for a minute. <laughs> Folks, if you want to stop back this way, we'll talk about these drills for a couple of minutes. What you have here is three pneumatic drills. I showed you the way that they drilled originally in here. Everything was by hand. 
talk about the drills coming out. And look at these two larger drills. They were out of the 1930s, uh, and they weigh around 300 pounds a piece. And now then, before you blast, uh, how many holes can you drill three feet deep in a 10-hour shift and blast? You're going to do 28 holes, and you're going to go eight feet deep with all of them, and you're going to use this. These two pneumatics here, it's going to take you about six to seven hours to drill 21 holes eight feet deep. And you're going to go through 60 to 80 drill bits to make that happen. And like I said, those are out of the 30s. You come over to this one. This is a Garner Denver Jack Leg. It came out in the 50s. It's still being manufactured today. They all are pneumatic. They have a circular and a hammer action to them. Uh, and they also have water hook to them. Now this one, difference in uh, nomenclature, this weighs 100 pounds compared to 300. And instead of taking six to seven hours to drill 20, uh, 21, not 28, 21 holes eight feet deep, you're gonna take about six to seven hours here. This will do it in about two to two and a half hours. You can drill eight feet deep in seven minutes. This one is gonna take 60 to 80 drill bits to make that happen. With this, to do the 21 holes, this machine, the drill bit, will drill about 120 holes before it is changed out. You go from a tungsten steel to a carbide steel drill bit. So there's a lot of changes. The, the advancement of technology in mining was extremely rapid. As you can see by going all in your ore out of here in a gunny sack to uh, just 40, 50 years later, they're hauling 80 tons at a time at 40 miles an hour. So that's considered extremely rapid in, the, in any industry for that type of employment. Any questions about these? Okay, folks, let's go right down here and stop on the, on the right-hand side when you get to the wood lagging suite. We'll go ahead and stop back there. Here we're going to talk about this for just a couple minutes. Okay, folks, I told you at that stop you're going to drill 21 holes eight feet deep. Now that is not random drilling, but there is a very specific pattern that is driven in order to make your blast work. You break the pattern, if you try blasting from the inside to the outside, you're not going to even crack your mountain. You have to blast from inside, outside, not outside, inside. Uh, what you have here, you know, seven feet up, you've got four holes straight across, drop down 16 inches, you have the same thing. Get in the middle though, and it's circular. Your last four at the bottom, they're called lifters. They're your hottest, they're six inches off the ground. When you blast out, the hole will be as tall as this wooden structure, as wide as this structure, eight feet deep, and have 60 to 80 tons inside your mouth. To make this happen, you start in the middle, and once you have five holes burned right here, only the one in the middle has dynamite. That one has to go first. If it doesn't go first, it'll take 140 to 180 sticks of dynamite to man this. If you don't blow that one first, you will waste 140 to 180 sticks of dynamite because you won't crack your mountain. But when this one goes off, eight to 10 sticks, what you're going to do is blast a hole out of here, eight feet deep, it's bigger than those five holes, and shoot that one rock straight across the room. From that point on, what you want is you blast, you create a reliever hole, you're going to blast from close, constantly working your way out, till you get to the bottom, those will be your last four. Now to make this happen, you're going to take that first one and you're going to cut it. You want them blasting out one second apart. So you're going to take your first one right out of the center, your reliever. You're going to set it in what is called a blasting panel. Put that on there. Then you're going to go to your next one. First one cut 15 inches down, then you're going 15 and a half. Then you're going to go to 16, 16 and a half, 17, 17 and a half, so on, until you get to the very bottom. Those four are cut the same length and they're mounted the same height. Now you take your lighting rod, which looks like a 4th of July sparkler. It serves two purposes. This is magnesium. You're going to burn it over 1,700 degrees. It is also your timer. 
you have 40 seconds to light 21 fuses and be out of here. <laughs> By the time you light the four on the bottom, the first one is burned past the hole, which means the fuse is burning past the dynamite to the blasting cap that is in the first stick of dynamite. First stick of dynamite is the only one that has a fuse line to it, the only one with the blasting cap. When that blasting cap goes off, every stick of dynamite in that hole will sympathetically detonate off that one blasting cap. But you take the rod, you hit it, you get a red or blue flame, smoke, it's hot, you go to the next one, so on. Everything is lit on that spitter board. You break that board and you drop it. Now, when you get to your last spitter board, there's just going to be four on that. Those four are going to be the same length. You take your spitter rod, you lay it flat across there, you light those four together. By now, you're at the end of your spitter rod, you light them together. Now, if this quits burning or you run out of, you get to the end of it and you haven't lit everything, you don't light another one. You don't have time. You leave. You deal with the fact that for every hole you missed, you have eight to ten sticks of live dynamite somewhere in the mix. <laughs> everything is blasted out. The four on the bottom, when those go, you'll have 60 to 80 tons of ore inside this mountain. When the, those 40 sticks go, they will actually lift everything up and push it out of the mountain. You stack it right here. So you'll have 60 to 80 tons of ore stacked here. Just a few shovels full left on the inside. Interesting. You're out of here because you're blasting 30 minutes before the end of your shift. Right. You cannot be in this room. It's going to be three or four hours before the next crew comes in. The way it'll operate, you'll blast 30 minutes before the end of your shift. There'll be anywhere from 1,200 to 1,500 identical blasts going off throughout the mines three times within a day. So you're out of here. The next crew is going to come in about three or four hours after you've left. They wet everything down because this room is full of uh, nitroglycerin powders, also silica dust. You wet it all down, make sure it's safe. Bring in a front end loader, you load everything up, haul it out of here. You set up, you drill, you blast. And now then the crew that you relieved is going to come in and take your ore out of here for you. And that's the way you constantly operate this. Any questions about that process? How, how many people do you get injured on in a year? Or? Uh, 367 <laughs> men died in the mines of this in a 97 year period. That's considered an extremely good safety record. Uh, you get into coal mining, you may lose 100 to 120 men in one day. The last coal mine accident in the United States, I believe, was in the mid to late 1980s, large accident. Uh, here, you're in a real hard rock, uh, so you didn't lose near as many. Injuries was a daily event. You know, everything from you're holding the steel, the guy misses the steel, takes your hand out, or your forearm, or your elbow, or your wrist, to uh, rocks falling, mules kicking, being killed on board a cage. So miners are always inventing a new way to get hurt or die underground. It's just the nature of the job. Were there many uh, medics or doctors around, or is it just it they would depend do, for themselves? Phelps Dodge had its own hospital okay. and its own doctors. So if someone was seriously injured underground, they didn't move them. They brought the doctor underground and the nurses underground to treat the person underground and remove them from underground. Gotcha. Hmm. Any, any other questions? Hey, folks, let's go to the back room. Right? Okay. Folks, the room you're standing in right now was cut in 1912. The timbers you're under are pine and uh, Douglas fir. They are originals. If you look right above me though, and you see different color wood, it's still the same wood. What you have back there, the reason that is dark, it's patina from age. We constantly will go in and check our timbers. This section in, in 2017 was found to be weak pulled everything down and replaced it. As you're going through the tunnel leaving, if you notice there are areas where we refer to this as blonde wood, just because of the coloration. You'll see the blonde wood, then you'll see the wood with a lot of patina. The blonde simply means the timber that was originally there was found to be uh, getting weak. We pulled it and replaced it. Now, the most photographed piece of equipment in here sits right here. Yeah. Uh, that is the original. <laughs> Port of John. <laughs> the official name, name is Sanitation Cart. 
The new miner called it the sanitation park. They have various other names for it. Uh, they're ahead of the time. It is a two-seater. <laughs> it weighs 500 pounds when it's empty. And the guy that services that, everybody think, well, that's beginning miner's position. No, guys bid for that job. Usually it's miners three, four, five years away from retirement. They're tired of working weekends, tired of working shift work, tired of working holidays. They bid in on this, eight to five. Uh, and you get paid the same as miners, but you do not get paid tonnage. I think you could have gotten paid tonnage. <laughs> but uh, these are still in effect throughout the mines uh, everywhere. They were created by the engineers in Bisbee, and they're still being used throughout the industry. Now, this one. <laughs> you look right behind these folks, you will see a cage. Now, a cage is the underground elevator. With this, we look right through here. Big difference between your elevator you see in your apartments, your hotels, and all is that has four sides. We do not have four sides. The only stand, thing standing between you and the face of the rock is four, six inches of air. So you're going up and down, and sometimes, especially if you're going down, you're moving at a rather rapid pace. First 30 to 40 feet is an instantaneous drop. Uh, so you're moving quite rapidly. You had to be careful on these. Uh, they were only one guy could request they be moved, and he pulled this ring this bell right here, which is heard on the surface by hoisting the engineer. The engineer is the only one that can move it. The cager is the only one that can request it be moved. Anyone other than the cager pull it over and they're fired instantly. No questions asked. You're out of here. That's how dangerous things are. Any questions about these people? These geodes. Twenty bucks, that's not bad at all. Man. Twenty bucks. Tempted. I have multi generational miners in my family and I am just uh, really fascinated by all this. here so it does get cold here during the winter. Well it gets cold in the desert too but it's higher up. Copyright 
there. Look at that. There's a big one in the back. Oh, that's so neat. My dad, I remember, he brought home, uh, he was allowed to bring home. It was uh, given to him because he served so many years. Uh, he had a nice copper. It was like four inches by six inches, like four by eight card, about a quarter inch thick of copper that he was allowed, well, he was given to. And my grandfather, he used to make jewelry. all kinds of rocks and minerals. Little penguins and bears, turtles. That's neat. Some eggs they made. This is the shop, it's right where the tour is. All on display and open for purchase. Wow, those are cool. Look at the design in that, all natural. Yeah, my grandfather used to cut, make cuts and then polish. And big process but it and the stuff he used to make was incredible let's make clocks to all kinds of jewelry necklaces rings those quartz ball a bowl I mean the zodiac calendar $70 wow that's cool These are cool. Jade, Onyx. Some fossils. Shark teeth. Wow, that is gorgeous. Different little animals. It's adorable. Rings, glow rings. That's cool. Oh wow. A lot of this stuff, I believe, was imported, but there are fossils here in Arizona um, that proves that Arizona was once ocean, which is uh, crazy to me, but there are fossils that have been found. Um, actually, if you saw my video on um, Colossal Cave, there was a section there that had fossils still on the wall. Shell life. Wow, that is empire. So beautiful. A lot of statues and stuff were made out of that. 
at this dude. John James. Jimmy Pierce. of the queen. Wow. All those different shafts. It's from 1909. For all these different mines. Wow. I'll be taking you up to Lowell. Uh, but here is the queen right there. Right there is where we're at. Wow. These are actually ones that have been pulled out into different lines that are here in Bisbee. Turquoise used quite a bit here. A lot of Native Americans, uh, but turquoise is uh, in Arizona. Boy, that turquoise is everywhere for jewelry. There's different drills that were in the uh, tour that were used over the years. This is cool. Different mine shafts. Well, let me get back a little further here. This one's much larger. It's a hard life. Very hard life. I mean, mining today is hard, but good Lord, I mean, back in the day, you know, all these small towns, well, even the larger towns, cities, uh, were all founded by, here in the West, were all by mining. That or the railroad as a station. Um, a lot of these places, uh, the ones that are larger the ones that didn't dry up from resources. That's gonna do it from Copper Creek Mine. Thank you for joining me. Um, what an amazing experience. I highly, highly recommend you guys coming down to Bisbee. Um, I would do two or three days here at least. There's so much here to do. Uh, this is just one example of uh, everything that's done here. Uh, if you guys can hit the thumbs up button, subscribe. I greatly appreciate the subscriptions are very important to me. Uh, trying to get monetized on YouTube uh, uh, so I can bring more things out to you. So I appreciate that. If you can share and uh, leave a comment been to Bisbee before uh, let me know what you liked about Bisbee and places I should go uh, go tour uh, lots of love peace